Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Joy Dobbins. Let's delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. Hello, and welcome to the Sound Bites podcast. Today's episode is about seed oils. What are they? And why are we hearing so much about them? And ultimately, are they healthy or not? We are going to discuss the science on seed oils and practical tips, including different kinds of culinary oils and how to use them in your own kitchen. My guest today is Dr. Wendy Bazilian. She is a doctorate in public health and nutrition, a registered dietitian nutritionist, and an American College of Sports Medicine certified exercise physiologist. She is also a writer, educator, food enthusiast, and award-winning journalist who maintains a busy private practice in San Diego with individuals from CEOs, artists, and actors to professional athletes, parents, and children seeking to improve their nutrition, fitness, and health. She is the author of several books and has contributed to many others. Welcome to the show, Wendy. Great to be with you, Melissa. Thank you for having me. I call you Wendy because I know you. Would you prefer that I call you Dr. Bazilian or Dr. Wendy? No, I mean, I appreciate that very much because it was certainly a hard-earned degree and I'm very proud of it. But hopefully that will sort of manifest through a friendly conversation today. But I have um, credibility for being here on this topic and we can leave it at that. Wendy is perfect. Awesome. Thank you. And I want to mention that this episode is not sponsored. Um, However, I did receive a gift of chia oil from you. Thank you so much. And when you tell us a little bit more about your background and disclosures, you can mention this chia oil. And we're going to talk about all kinds of oils, but specifically some interesting things regarding chia oil. So I would love for you to tell us more about your background. I know you have vast experience. And I've seen you in many different capacities. And, and you're just a pleasure to watch present and, and to listen to. And I learned so much from you. But I would love our listeners to get to know you a little bit better. And you know maybe how you got interested in nutrition, or whatever you would like us to know about the work you do. Thank you so much. You know, um, probably as with you, it's sort of my career and, and who I am has evolved over time, even though my core identity has stayed the same. As a human, I am an avid eater, a spirited person. I love to communicate with others. And um, that have been the sort of universal truths of who I am. I live in San Diego, California for 30 years um, now. I'm so jealous, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) It is a nice place um, to be. But hail from Connecticut originally. So I grew up on the east. I had a healthy dose of cold winters and Mm -hmm. beautiful falls. And we still, you know, go back and enjoy that as frequently as we can. Um, So I got into nutrition and then I'll give a few disclosures on like what I do and who I work with. But I like to say I got into nutrition through the back door and straight into the kitchen. Mm -hmm. I have always loved food, as I mentioned. And I've always loved and showed proficiency in science. I didn't know how those connected for a very long time, by the way. Wow. For some reason, that just didn't link up and sync up until later. My first degree actually is in Spanish language and literature, of all things. I know. That's so interesting. (laughs) With a uh, minor in Latin American studies. And from there, I got a master's degree in Latin American studies. And The path now has shown to sort of why and where and how Mm. I am, um, who I am today. But at the time, I wasn't quite sure. I just really thought that a great liberal arts degree that was multidisciplinary would somehow help me have a perspective on the world and allow me to talk with more people, Mm. which was the language part of it. And it did. So when I did my master's degree in Latin American studies, I actually did field research in Northeast Brazil. Wow. I picked up a language there because I thought if I'm going to study Latin America, I should learn Portuguese. Wow. And I started doing field research with a public health group in a very impoverished indigent area in Northeast Brazil around maternal health, around infant mortality, and around breastfeeding in the very, very interior of Northeast Brazil. It was sort of there that the intersection of public health and nutrition and how you can change and also learning that 
you know, where we live doesn't always have all the ideas or the right ideas sometimes. This was a very grassroots public health theater group that was re-promoting breastfeeding in an area where potable water was scarce and Mm -hmm. food was scarce. And there was a perception going around that breast milk was not adequate Mm -hmm. somehow for infants. Um, It was from that point that I said, aha, nutrition is where I want to be. And I started backtracking a lot on the science. I had to go sort of back to school on some of the things I was taking as hobbies Mm -hmm. and pursued a doctoral degree in public health and nutrition, pursued the registered dietitian nutritionist credential, which you well know takes years of commitment and upkeep. And also uh, my health and fitness orientation, I became credentialed as an exercise physiologist through the American College of Sports Medicine. So those are my creds, the letters (laughs) that come after my name. But really, it all comes back then to communicating about it. Mm. So I won't go through all of the where's, you know, paint my path because we have a very important topic to talk about that's very trendy and interesting. But I do consulting today. I'm in private practice. I do consulting and presenting and I do communication strategy on some of my clients include one that I'm going to bring up just topically more than anything else, which is a company called Benexia, which makes chia ingredients and the chia oil that you received is from and through uh, their brand. Okay. And also a few others. I've worked with fresh avocados recently with Hydrolite, which is, it's a medicinal food that is one of those, I call them hydration helpers. I'm not actively right now, but just to, you know, showcase a few that sort of cross and intersect with my philosophical professional passion, Uh, lean into the evidence always in science when I work with them. And then I am a huge advocate of mentoring and scholarship. So I'm on the board of the California Academies Foundation. So I work with the scholarships and students, mentor a number of individuals as well. That is not a short um, answer for you, Melissa, but <laughs> I love that's it. who I am, at least sitting here today. Yeah, I mean, you <laughs> have so much experience and passion in all these different areas. And I love to see how it does intersect and come together. And I like to see, like with my career, like hindsight's twenty twenty, all the choices and turns and twists that I made in my career. At the time, I was just making the best decisions I could at the time. But looking back, it all makes perfect sense, right? Yeah. Thankfully, yeah. you know, um, that you're sort of like on the path and it doesn't have to be and rarely is straight. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Well, thank you. No, I loved learning more about you and uh, having our listeners hear that as well. So let's dive into the topic of seed oils. As you said, it's very trendy. I'm curious how you got interested in the topic to begin with, and we're going to get into the science and what they are and everything, but how did it come across your radar screen? Yeah, my professional education training is rooted in science and research, and I am, you know, the person who just loves the latest papers that come out and evaluating the quality of the science and reading about p-values and all that (laughs) And when it comes to nutrition science. So that's part and parcel with what I'm scanning as to you um, each and every day. Um, The area about seed oils, I also really try to keep up on trends, not just trends that I see being headlined about, Mm. but trends that start bubbling up. So the benefit of, you know, working with individuals and also working with big groups and working in health insurance companies doing some things is that you start to see things pop up that spark curiosity. And I always think when it comes to nutrition, I haven't seen an exception yet, but um, like one if you know one. But when people start talking about nutrition topics, it tells me they care So even if it's misinformed Mm -hmm. (laughs) or partially informed or a little off track on what the science says, maybe I even don't know all the science yet and I go digging. It sort of tells me, well, this topic is interesting to them. And so I start, you know, mapping that. And and my brain, it just works like that. It's got a lot of different spokes sort of throwing out and putting things together. And I started seeing this topic about seed oils being bad. You know, that's sort of the topic. Mm -hmm. And before anything else going, instead of like just going, oh, that's phooey, that's not right. Or, you know, whoever that person is talking about has got it all wrong. I was like, that is curious that that perception, I wonder why. Mm -hmm. So I started just asking why, like the best four-year-olds out there, I have one of those. (laughs) And um, I started digging around and I know a good amount about fats and the biochemistry of fats and how fats work. I've worked with some premier uh, researchers in that area personally. And so that's sort of where 
it comes in. And then in my desire to educate and help, hopefully, I tried to dig into the science and help communicate out, help balance the conversation, Mm -hmm. you know, not disparage anyone or take them down. But, you know, it's what I love to do. It's part passion, part interest and part skill set, I guess. Excellent. So let's discuss what seed oils are. I'll be honest, when I started hearing about them on social media, I was like, what are seed oils? I don't know this term. Is this a new term? Is this just like a scientific term that just turned popular. What are they? Yeah. And are we seeing it in the traditional media too? Yes. Yes. Social media. And it is definitely come into the traditional media. I'm happy to say that there has been a recent sort of balancing act happening, which hopefully we'll be talking about today, but it's coming about. Okay. It's a prominent conversation. Seed oils, we already know them. You already know them. You know, um, they're a collective term that for sunflower oil and canola oil and cottonseed oil and corn oil and soybean oil. These are seed, literally, oils that have been somehow processed to extract their oils. They are trending in part because, and this will probably percolate over the course of our time together, but There's some misinformation on it because I think they're in part a proxy at times for ultra processed foods. Mm. And since we're talking very often about ultra processed foods these days and bad versus good, evil versus good, I don't know what these seed oils do feature some of them in some of these ultra processed foods. They also, some of these seed oils, some call them the hateful eight. I'm not going to recite what the eight are. I named a few of them. I did not name eight. And they weren't exhaustive. This list is not exhaustive. And so that's where the opportunity is to play out. Well, aren't seeds good? You know, (laughs) how did they get into oil? You know, why did they get into oil? How do we use them? And really, it's the seed oils that have been really tagged and targeted are the ones that are higher in the omega-6 fats. So people are hearing omega-6 bad, omega-3 good. Mm -hmm. Not that simple, unfortunately. Right. And so I think it's a convergence of like the ultra processed food, the omega-6 being bad, general confusion, and then a few very loud voices who have come out and sort of across the board said, delete these from your diet. They are bad Mm -hmm. with a little bit, sometimes a lot of misinformation. Right. I'm used to hearing the term vegetable oil. Is there a distinction between vegetable? Because I think of corn oil and soybean oil as vegetable oil. Is there a distinction? Yeah, well, not a lot of distinction. I would say, you know, if we're getting granular, it's sort of, it gets down to the botany, you know, like Mm -hmm. botanically, are they coming from a seed source? Uh. But it really could be any oil. A seed is in the plant kingdom. And I think that that's where the sort of nomenclature becomes a little bit more flexible um, on calling the vegetable oils. So, you know, a corn oil or safflower oil, the fact that they're being pressed from the seeds, I think that's just like a a level beyond and people are categorizing them. You know, what's not on the list, which we'll talk about, you know, and not heralding it better than in all cases, but, you know, chia is not talked about chia oil, but it's not something that we, a lot of us even know about. Right. And I think when we're looking at what we'll discover and discuss is that it all starts with the seed. So okay. what are the nutrients in the seed? Okay. Next is what is the processing? And we will go through each one of these, but what is the processing that happens to the seed? Um, what's done after that determines some of the characteristics and the personality and also some of their culinary use. So some of them have positive attributes like neutral flavor and you can cook at high temperatures, you know, at the same time, they may have some, uh, you know, the risk benefit ratio, so to speak, um, that we got to look at when we're using it on the plate in a culinary way. Okay, great. That is very helpful. And I know we're going to talk a lot about what the research shows about seed oils, unsaturated fats. And I have a related episode, well, a couple of related episodes, uh, but one in particular is 218, omega-6 PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids, inflammation, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease with Dr. Martha Bolluri. I'll link to that in the show notes. And I also have done some episodes on processed foods and ultra-processed foods. So those links will all be in the show notes at soundbitesrd.com. And we are going to talk about omega-3s and omega-6s quite a bit. But what does the research show either in general or any specific uh, studies that you want to talk about, about seed oils and unsaturated fats? And also, this is a double question here. What does the average intake look like for Americans? Yeah, so these are two great questions, Melissa. And I think in order to 
get to the research, which is not unanimous. Research is research. So we want to see, you know, that not every study shows unanimity. We want the methods to be well organized and planned and quality. But, you know, I'd like to anchor us briefly around why the topic is so important by looking at the fats in general. Okay. And what's really interesting is that we're even talking about fats as being fascinating. You know, I think that's really cool in the first place. Yes. Um, But the idea about the essential fats, we hear about this. And I think that, you know, most of your listeners will know this inherently or they know this from their training. But sometimes we glaze over the word. We hear essential fatty acids or essential fats. And certain fats are essential because the body does not make them. They do not endogenously produce them. So we have to get them from the diet. So, you know, as a quick you know, recap, I won't go deep into the weeds here, but a fat is one of our macronutrients, of course. It is not a vitamin or mineral. It's found in a lot of different foods and its primary action, aside from some nerve and, you know, other hormones and other areas where it plays in the body, but it's for energy. Mm-hmm. You know, it's for energy. It's the calories. It's for insulation of our body as well. In the essential fats, two major classes that are essential are the omega-3 and the omega-6. And we just have a tendency, you know, to like make one better than the other or start looking at that. But it's important to sort of anchor us in, you know, the omega-3s and the omega-6s getting toward the essential fats because that's really where the seed oil controversy and claims come. And I can talk about some of those claims that people are saying about them um, if you'd like to hear in a minute. Okay, great. But the essential fat is ALA or alpha linolenic acid. That's the omega-3 that comes from plants. It's like the parent. And from that, EPA and DHA are sort of the siblings or the cousins that can be converted from ALA. But it's also abundant, and we hear a lot about this in marine sources, you know, like salmon and and other sources. So the only essential one, though, is the plant one, because that one you literally can't make. The other ones you can make, and there's questions about conversion and ratios. I don't know how thick we'll get into that. But the idea is that we have that omega-3 and we're not getting enough. So the question is, you know, how much do we need to get? And I'll get to that in a second. Mm-hmm. The other one is the omega-6s. Omega-6s also play an important and complementary and balancing act to the omega-3s. And they're also essential. So just to throw them under the bus arbitrarily that anything with N6s, they're also called in science, omega-6s are bad is right out the gate mischaracterizing this fat. Okay. And the omega-6s do tend to be pro-inflammatory, but the bigger issue in the human diet is that we're getting too much of them. Mm. So this is sort of queuing up on, you know, where's our intake? Our intake levels are adequate intake. So a reminder, this is not a one-size-fits-all approach, but for most people, the adequate intake is about reached for the omega-3s, believe it or not. Some people say we're way deficient. Wow. Um, But compelling research is starting to suggest that the adequate intake that's set is too low and that maybe it should be two to four times higher than what the adequate intake of 1.1 grams a day should be for the ALA omega-3. Okay. Too many numbers, I know. No, that's helpful. But just keep in mind, we're sort of meeting it, but the compelling research for health benefit and health support and health promotion is suggesting we might need two to four times as much. And this is not me saying it. This is what the science and leading scientists in this area are saying. Got it. At the same time, um, the omega-6, we are getting too much. We're getting too much of that. So the idea of reducing consumption or finding places where it exists in the diet that you might either shift toward omega-3s or simply reduce some of these omega-6s may be warranted. So we are getting in excess of our needs on the omega-6s. That's the, the simple answer. I don't think we should go deeper into that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, and then on, on the research, you know, you asked about that. There is a large and growing body of research on unsaturated fats in general. So that would include these polyunsaturated fats, the omega-3 and the omega-6. I think that that's where even among registered dietitians that I've spoken to about this, we sort of get in, not to group think, but we sort of forget sometimes. You know, we know some of the functions that are not health promoting of omega-6s, and maybe we're just not up to speed on some of the research on the omega-6s. 
But there is a good body of evidence. And the American Heart Association came out with sort of a, a lead paper back in 2009 saying, Omega-6 is actually our protective for heart health. They're helpful for heart health, you know, in a number of ways. And there's many, many studies that have come beyond that. And so the research on cardiovascular health probably being the strongest uh, sort of health-related association with the unsaturated fats for both omega-3s and omega-6s, anti-inflammatory benefits, and then the host of, you know, chronic diseases associated with diet that also may be linked to chronic inflammation. That's very helpful. I appreciate how you're explaining this. And yeah, we could take a deep dive on the science. I will say in episode 218 with Martha, there were times when I was like, okay, wait, I'm trying to understand. It's very sciencey, but it's very, very interesting. Yes. And I appreciate one of the main takeaways is it's not that omega 3s are good and omega 6s are bad. That's way oversimplified. And even this ratio that we sort of um, just kind of clung to the ratios of omega 3s to omega 6s in the diet. And just the awareness that there are some benefits, health benefits to the polyunsaturated fats with regard to the omega-6s. Because we know, everybody knows the omega-3s are good. So it's kind of trying to tease out some of those benefits that we may not be aware of. So let's talk, and maybe I'm jumping ahead here, but if you, you kind of gave a little bit of an overview of oils and fats in general. But I know one of the things that we wanted to talk specifically about is these different culinary oils. And it goes beyond smoke point. That's one of the things I've learned from you. What do we need to know or consider when we're choosing different oils? You've got a good resource uh, that I'm going to put in the show notes as well, because some of this, it's a little bit, it helps to have a resource, a handout or something to go to, because there's a lot of different oils and there's a lot of different factors to consider from my understanding. So where should we start with that whole category, that whole topic. Yeah. Where do we start? Right. So imagine the supermarket aisle. You know, I wish I, I'm going to paint this the best I can to your ears. But the next time you're in a major supermarket, walk down the aisle where the oils, the liquid oils are. Not whip through it and grab the one you're looking for or whiz by. Go look and take it in. It is a huge section. It's a huge aisle sometimes. It's tremendous. And there's every shape of bottle, there's every color of bottle, there's every material made of bottle. It is top to bottom. There's every price point of these bottles. I mean, there's no surprise that it feels daunting Mm -hmm. and confusing and that we can stir some controversy around that, certainly. Mm -hmm. With each of the oils, there could be 10 different options within that oil. Olive oil, you know, which one, which press, which brand. So it can certainly be confusing. When we consider using them for cooking, and actually a colleague of ours, a registered dietitian colleague of ours, just told me yesterday about a conversation she had over the weekend with a friend who's asked her, our colleague, you know, why do you have five oils on your counter? You know, I only cook with one. Hmm. And she said, oh my gosh, it opened up this great conversation. A lot of people still believe, you know, we just need one, you know, just choose one. Use the one that can be, you know, multi-purpose. And I would argue that there are different oils for different uses. And hopefully I'll leave, you know, you and your listeners with, you know, not the long list unless you're really enthusiastic about your oils and you, you like to have lots and lots of different ones. But maybe the reason that you might have four or five different oils in your pantry. Mm-hmm. We want to be driven by flavor. I didn't say nutrition first. Mm -hmm. We want to be driven by flavor. We want to be driven by the functionality of it. How does it fit into the food that we want to make? And can we use it cooking? So smoke point comes to play as well as some other factors. You know, does it have nutrients we're interested in? You know, can we afford it? And so those are all factors that come in. Sometimes you want a neutral oil that can hit a high smoke point. And guess what? That may be a pretty refined seed oil. And is that problematic? Well, in a balanced diet, we're not only eating one ingredient. No, it's not a problem. You might use that to sear and you might use other oils along the way for other culinary purposes. Mm -hmm. So that's a start on that. But cooking technique, flavor, function, and I hope, you know, a little bit of nutrition, if you can get that in there as well. That's a great overview. And I should back up and say, because you had mentioned you could touch on some of the seed oil claims. Maybe we should go through some of that because if somebody's not familiar with seed oils or the controversy, they might be wondering more. 
yeah, what's the deal? You know, why are we talking about this or who's talking about this? So to make a proof point, I'm going to read this one media outlet and I have this note in front of me. One media outlet reported, while doctors and scientists peruse PubMed for evidence, lay people report to places like TikTok, where the war against seed oil rages on. Videos tagged with hashtag seed oils have been viewed over 31 million times on TikTok. So why are we talking about this and what are those claims? It's created all kinds of buzz. Um, one of them is inflammation. So I mentioned that before. When we learn about a nutrient, like we hear about omega-6, usually we hear about the prominent one or it gets flagged for some reason in some headline and we just stick to it. Like that's what it does. End of story. Some seed oils, not all, contain some pro-inflammatory omega-6s. So there's always a seed of truth to <laughs> any claim, I imagine. I love it. Also, some people say it's all about that ratio. We've got the ratio all wrong. You know, you mentioned that before and it's brought up. I'd like us to start using the word balance. So the ratio being how many omega-3s to omega-6s are in the diet. Um, there's no question that we're over-consuming the omega-6s, under-consuming the omega-3s. But it's not a strict ratio that we need to bring in. That's sort of the old school thought. It is more complicated than that. And there are other functions. Another claim is that seed oils are toxic. So it's a word that's controversial in the first place. They have chemicals. Mm. That may mean they're processed with different solvents or how they come to become the oil. Different um, processing and that processing means harm. So anything that we hear these days, you know, to make cheese, you've got to process dairy, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, that one gets a pass, but <laughs> the seed oils don't because process equals harm. Um, the concept of refined versus unrefined. And there's some merit to this on the one hand, but refined, another word that just triggers us. <laughs> and stable versus unstable. So actually, some people feel that the refined oils are more stable and that hasn't worn out, actually, mm. um, in every way but that some oils are more stable or less stable. And like I mentioned before, that seed oils are a proxy or they represent ultra-processed food. So many times you'll see people out on TikTok or the social media sort of showing a food product, mm. you know, or the label and say, look at these seed oils on the label. And so they'll be painting a picture of, you know, badness mm. um, by association, you know, the group it's playing with in the ingredient list of that food. And then I think that everyone just loves a conspiracy theory every once in a while. <laughs> so, you know, we want to bash science or be anti-establishment or, you know, that kind of thing. Yep. And I, I shouldn't laugh at that, but that definitely exists. If we don't laugh, we'll cry, right? Yeah, exactly. That's very helpful. Uh, some of that I had heard, but some of that it was news to me. And I love that there's a seed of truth to that. I was kind of thinking that earlier, not necessarily in those terms, but I always love a play on words. So. Let's talk about chia oil specifically. I had not heard of it before, so I think a lot of people haven't heard of it. Tell us about it and maybe a little bit of the consulting work. And again, this isn't sponsored, but this is an area that you've done a lot of work in. And also I can tell you how I used it in my own kitchen. I can't wait to hear about that, <laughs> Melissa. I'm really excited. I love sharing ideas about, you know, how we use information and how we use ingredients. So my introduction to Chia goes back a while. I mean, I knew, as probably you did, you know, the chia seed, which dates back 3,500 years. Mm. Um, I don't date back that far, but yeah. I, I like studying, you know, part of my background and fascination, and it's native to Latin America um, and prominent there, is about food culture and indigenous foods to areas and that kind of thing. So mm. most of us learned about or experimented with chia pudding or chia so I knew that they were a source of omega-3. So I already thought they were cool. Mm -hmm. I even knew how to use them in some ways. I still have in my garage two terracotta chia pet starters, you know, so. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> if you'd like to see those brought to life, I could do that for you too. Um, I love it. Send you pictures. <laughs> but I did a media segment. I was looking this up before we spoke because I'm like, gosh, I even put it in a media segment long before this, back to 2010. Mm. Um, I had done something about chia. So I knew about the science of fats. I knew two of my dissertation advisors on my committee research fats and omega-3s and that area. And I'd done quite a bit with the nut studies and was well aware of some of the omega-3 
um, containing nut, mm. walnut in particular, and the deep body of research there. So sort of that area was known to me. Mm -hmm. What I didn't know, and, you know, as life has its circuitous paths, I was introduced to Benexia, which is a company that does exclusively chia ingredients in Santiago, Chile as their headquarters, but distribution all over, is I didn't know about the ingredients that come from it and processing and the journey on how it's grown exactly and how does it become oil. Those are things that I learned over time. So I work with companies sometimes that bring me in that I align with professionally and philosophically um, that I actually use and enjoy and that respect and want to lean in on evidence, mm -hmm. science, and that I think my skill will fit their needs. So that's sort of how we came together. But what I didn't know was that chia seed in this day and age where uh, sustainability sort of go part and parcel with nutrition priorities, I think, for global health, mm -hmm. that chia is grown with regenerative agriculture. Okay. Um, in the company that I'm working with, the 50% of the owners of the company are the farmers. Wow. You know, we could dive into every one of these <laughs> aspects that zero water input except from Mother Nature goes wow. into growing chia. And that the purity, you're only as good as your seed, that the purity is tested to ensure that the nutrients that come out of the seed before anything is done to them is near 100%, 99.98% or something. These are things I've learned. Mm -hmm. um, so the chia oil is cold pressed, no food waste. The rest goes into chia fiber and a chia protein. And, you know, it's just sort of wow. Then I got to taste it and then I got to experiment with it and start using it, which really was for me what really sealed the deal on. Wow, this is something that can very simply, one teaspoon has your entire daily need of our essential fatty acid ALA, one teaspoon. Wow. But, you know, I use it because it tastes good mm -hmm. and you can cook with it and these wow other things that I came to learn along the way. Yeah, the versatility. So I used it, I got some tips from you um, and how to use it. I used it in roasted broccoli and I sauteed some zucchini with it. And I made a vinaigrette dressing because one of the things that you told me, typically I'll, I'll use an olive oil. But as people know, if they've made their own vinaigrette with olive oil, you put it in the fridge and it solidifies a little bit. So then you have to let it set out at room temperature before you use it. And that's not very convenient, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so you suggested I use it in a vinaigrette. And so I can make that, put it in the fridge, get it out and use it right away because it stays liquid. So that that's my favorite thing about it. It's great. And you also gave me a sorbet recipe. I did not make it, but I would love for you to talk about that a little bit because I know you worked with a friend of yours, an amazing chef. And I will put this recipe in the show notes at soundbitesrd.com so people can make this sorbet. So tell us about this recipe. For sure. Oh, my gosh. So this is going to be hopefully a surprise, unexpected. And then we can back up and, you know, all the other delicious ways to use chia oil. So I tapped a longtime colleague and friend of mine, Chef Dean Rucker. Um, I hope he's listening. <laughs> I do, too. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I'm sure he will. He's this longtime colleague of mine who is so innovative. And I worked with for over a decade at a destination spa and resort up here in San Diego. We worked in tandem day in, day out, you know, sourcing from the garden, talking about food and ingredients, talking about how to bring health into delicious spa cuisine, three meals a day to snacks and add to support a modest calorie and five mile hikes and all kinds of classes all day long. Um, so we really had a tall order. What he pointed out is a couple things I'd like to share about oils in general, culinary oils, which make. I think this topic so exciting that we can bring it to the seed oil aspect of it is you can use different oils for different functions, as we know, different flavors, and you can layer them. Mm. So, you know, you may not use just one single oil. So we can look at your salad dressing and other recipes in a second on that. But when it came to sorbet, think about a sorbet. So we think of sorbet as sort of light and fruity not typically with a cream or milk base. Uh, it's usually basically fruit and sugar. What happens, and this is the chemistry that's so cool when you go into the freezer with fruit and sugar, is it crystallizes. And so the result is high flavor, 
And if you're making it sort of spa and you're bumping up the nutrition, you're not putting as much sugar in. It's high flavor, but it sort of gets crystallized a little bit. It's not quite as creamy. Mm -hmm. There's a few fruits that can make things creamy, like bananas. But, you know, every smoothie and every sorbet doesn't need to have a banana in it. What happens when you want a nectarine or pineapple, uh, mango that we're doing here, um, sorbet? Um, How do you get the mouthfeel back? Or let's say you don't consume dairy, either because you're plant-based by choice and preference, or you don't tolerate it for whatever reason. The plant-based milks that may substitute in for nice creams, um, Mm -hmm. so to speak, Mm -hmm. they lose some of that creamy Mm mouthfeel. What does fat do? It gives the mouthfeel. You know, it does that. And people are like, whoa, that's sort of mind-blowing. Right. What the chia oil does, just a little bit, is bonus nutrition. But it gives the mouthfeel. And so this is as much about creating a delicious experience as a really cool recipe. It's pineapple, mango, chia, oil, sorbet. And I encourage, you know, people who are making mostly fruit sorbets in general. And there's a bunch of different, you'll have the recipe up here. We always talk about substitutions. Could you do this? Could you use frozen fruit? Could you use fresh? What if you don't have this? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. But think about that when you're bringing sorbet. So what I loved about working with Chef Dean on this is he always brings it one level further with me. It's like not just substitutions, but like, why are we doing this? You know, so what's the purpose of this? Mm. And um, that's really what this is all about. Excellent. Now I'm even more interested in trying it. As soon as you started explaining the function, I love that different functions, different flavors. And uh, I have to say the ways that I use the chia oil I loved it. My family loved it. So the flavor was really good there, too. Do you want to talk about some good ways or fun ways or tasty ways to use other specific oils? And if you have any other recipes that you want to mention, I don't know if that you have any on your website or just favorite go tos that you have. Yeah, well, I think that like laying the groundwork of the fact that different oils do different things. um, I think we can talk about how we might choose based on the flavor and the function. Mm -hmm. So before we were talking a little bit about smoke point, and one of the things that I was inspired to do when I started doing this consulting work on chia oil was actually to serve the entire culinary oil population because I felt what was lacking was a really solid sort of document. So one of the great links out that you'll have for your show notes, Melissa, for your listeners, is this what I call the smoke point document. And really what it does is it sort of spells out what you might use for finishing and drizzling or dressings, Mm -hmm. what you might be able to use for that, but also use at low saute Mm. or bring up to a medium high heat. And what you really might want to use in terms of oils, if you're really wanting a high heat sear and safety. It also talks about how smoke point itself is not the only thing that determines the quality of the oils you choose. Uh, So there are things like antioxidants that exist in some of these plant oils, which is incredible. Antioxidants actually make chia oil more stable. Impurities in some other oils make the oil less stable. So not everything boils down to whether it's refined or unrefined or whether it's cold pressed. So this document is really a good guide for sort of getting the basics on what could I use where and why does it matter? And then there's sort of the flavor angle, like what are you making with this food? Um, I like to think down the path, both in terms of what meal are we talking here, but also what method am I thinking of cooking? So if you're going from room temperature, that would be like salad dressings and drizzles. I really like to use olive oil. But to your point, put it in the refrigerator, it starts to solidify. Mm -hmm. Why not make a blend? That's where I think chia oil and olive oil or chia avocado and olive oil together make a really incredible emulsifying agent in your vinaigrette that will stay liquid in the refrigerator, offer some of those polyunsaturated fats, be a good conveyor of flavor and so forth. What other things? Oh, pestos. Another great place. Another one that's known for olive oil. I like to change it up a little bit. Sometimes you want a little more kick of flavor, you know, whether it's olive oil and extra virgin olive oil that has a little more of that bite. Mm -hmm. I've just gotten a little bit of an education. I'm sure you've done olive oil tastings before where they say, is it a one cough or a three cough (laughs) olive oil? You know, like what level of antioxidants are coming through there, which is pretty neat to think about. Sometimes you want a little bit more or a different 
kind of earthy note to your flavor. And sometimes you want neutral. Like if you're searing fish that you want the flavor of the fish to really shine and the quality of the fish to shine, you might want to have one of the high smoke point quality grapeseed oils or an avocado oil that does have a higher smoke point. And the list sort of goes on right to cold applications like sorbets, um, smoothies and that kind of thing. Interesting. Yes, I'm looking at this handout or this document while you're talking. And it reminds me that we tend to forget also that all oils are a combination of polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, even saturated. And we tend to think, oh, olive oil is monounsaturated. And that's not the case. They're all sort of a combination. Yes. And they have different levels. And so I'm looking at this and I printed it out in black and white. But I can still see, so can see the different bars. So we think of like flaxseed oil as having a lot of omega-3s, but the chia oil is even higher. Mm-hmm. Those what I'm comparing on this chart. So yes, that's interesting. And again, you know, not one better than the other per se. Sometimes it's like we need a little more information, right? Mm-hmm. But we can see you wouldn't use a flaxseed oil for cooking. It does have a relatively low smoke point. Right. It's at the bottom of the list as far as the temperatures. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Nice to point that out um, this way. So when you see it and it will make sense and it will give you maybe more confidence, um, at least with that level, because when I started working on this and I'm so glad that you like called attention to there's there's not only one kind of oil. See, that's another oversimplification. It's not wrong, you know, that we speak in the priority one, but it's a great sort of example on how a little seed of truth can kind of get blown out of proportion if someone, uh, you know, that doesn't know the science or have a, a more balanced perspective on it starts speaking about it, maybe with good intentions. I really believe in good intentions if there are humans out there. Yes, that's a great point. Yeah, so I think that this document, this handout will provide a lot more depth to what we've been talking about and be a good resource for people to use in their own kitchens. Is there anything that you wanted to share with us kind of top line? Like I'm in my kitchen. What are some sort of basic go to's as far as use this type of oil for this, use this type of oil for that? Yeah. So one of the most common questions I get as a dietitian when I'm working with individuals or when we're talking about this topic is like, then how many should I have in my pantry and which ones? Mm -hmm. I want to just give some guidance and some ideas real briefly. One. Now you should know to be selective with choosing your oil. It's not an afterthought. It's not, oh, I have oil, I'm going to use it. So quality matters uh, as well as some of these other factors. Number two, different oils have different flavors and uses. So that goes to, you know, getting to know the flavor profile of them and what use are you thinking about. Have just a top few everyday oils, unless you're a big foodie enthusiast and you want to expand your repertoire. Um, maybe four, have an extra virgin olive oil that you would not cook with. You know, it really is that special oil for dressings and blends and toppings and drizzles. Maybe an avocado oil. We know the great monounsaturated fats and healthy profile of that oil. And it's good for cooking, high smoke point, neutral flavor, pretty neutral flavor. Uh, Coconut oil, maybe one. And again, these are all, you know, up to the individual, but coconut oil, you can bake with it really nice. Uh, You can use it in place of butter sometimes. It does on purpose, you know, it's the chemistry, stay semi-solid. It's good for popcorn. It's Mm -hmm. fun that way if you like the coconut flavor. And then I would say chia oil um, because you can cook with it. You can blend with it. You can put it in all these different places. And one teaspoon brings you an excellent source of that plant, omega-3. But the last thing, the last consideration I would say in your pantry oils is don't forget about blends and layering. You know, you can use a couple different oils in tandem. You can experiment with that. You can add an oil at the start of a recipe and an oil to finish at the end. And I guess that fats aren't all bad. You know, we know that they're important, essential for our health. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so I have to show my culinary, mm, I don't want to say limitations, but my basic culinary knowledge here. So I have olive oil that I cook with frequently. I think, I don't know if it's extra virgin or not. Um, So I tend to use that to saute or to roast vegetables and everything. Is that, well, you said don't use 
extra virgin olive oil. That's more for like drizzling and that sort of thing. But just like regular olive oil, is that okay for cooking? Because that's what I do. Yeah, yes. This is a great question. And I do not want the olive oil folks who I also love coming after me for this one. You can cook with your extra virgin olive oil. What I mean is sometimes if you apply high, high heat, you know, so regular sautés and they've been using it like that and the Mediterranean and we in the United States and, um, and in Spain and all over the world for a long time cooking with it. But it starts to change the characteristic when you apply heat to it. So, you know, a smoke point is actually a burning point. It's when you see smoke come off of the pan. So if you actually see a bluish hue come, probably too high of a smoke point, is it going to be harmful? If you did that regularly, it might become harmful, but not on a one-off. It just might make your food not taste very good. Mm -hmm. So what I mean to revise my statement before, so thank you, because a lot of people have this. If you're spending a lot of money on a very special extra virgin olive oil with lots of you know labels and distinctions, I would suggest that one. Maybe you don't cook with that one because you want it to come across like you want the flavor to hit your tongue. You want that. Right. That's what you dip the nice bread in and yeah. you know, drizzle yeah. on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. The one you dip in bread that you want to drizzle over the top that each, you know, bite on the fork, you get a little hit of that peppery um, mm. bite. That's fantastic. OK, thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate that. Of course. Is there anything else that you wanted to touch on or address regarding research? Yeah, there's three categories that please be my guest to select from, you know, that I have some notes on. One, if you'd like me to very briefly point to some of the health research and studies. Yes. Um, there's been a lot of very recent health research in the area that is coming about looking specifically at the omega-3, the plant omega-3 ALA, including a 2022 meta-analysis and review about the alpha linolenic, the plant-based omega-3. This is a great paper. We can provide the link out. And it talks about the mechanism of action and what we don't know and some newer mechanisms of action to start understand a little bit further. Um, I'm very research-based, so if there's any other research, we have a lot of research. There's a lot that's still not known, but there's a lot of research on this area. Okay. So as we're wrapping up, we've talked about the science, the kitchen, all kinds of things. But is there sort of any bottom line takeaways that you'd like to just summarize for us? Yes. So when we're talking about something that can be so controversial, like the seed oil story, hopefully we've made a, a balancing act of it to show sort of where it nuts out. And what I'd like to share is a reminder, really, of some things. Number one, we know that a healthy diet is not comprised of one food ingredient or nutrient. We need variety. We need high quality and nutrient dense foods and that we eat meals and patterns of meals over time. Um, number two, I hope your listeners can feel confident cooking with and enjoying the plant-based oils, either again or anew or new ones. The types of fats found in oils, the unsaturated, the essential fats that we talked about, those omega-6s and omega-3s are beneficial for health, especially when they're eaten in place of some of the saturated fats in our diet. Uh, third, I would say diversify the oils in your pantry a little bit. We talked about that for both nutrition and cooking capabilities. So hopefully people will go away with function and flavor and nutrition as three key attributes to think about and have a small assortment of culinary oils in your kitchen. And finally, we can look for lots of easy ways to incorporate more omega-3s in our diet. Those ones that we are seeking more of. And in particular, the essential one in the plant-based form. I think that the marine sources are delicious and wonderful, and we get a lot of attention on that salmon and sardines. But think of things like chia and chia oil and walnuts and flax, as well as the marine sources. Uh, plant-based omega-3 have some overlapping and also some unique benefits that the research is showing for human health. So that's sort of my wrap up to synthesize all of this great information that you've queued up for our conversation today. Oh, thank you so much. That is very helpful. I love it. Those are some excellent takeaways and just organizes sort of everything that we've touched on. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. So where can people find out more about this topic, the research, just connect with you? Uh, if you could share your website, social media, any of that information would be great. Sure. I love connecting. I mean, that's what I love to do. So my best connection on social media would be on Instagram at, at Bazillions. It's my last name spelled like 
Brazilian without the R, but you put the S at Bazillions. My website is wendybazillion.com and you can email me straight from there and I will be in touch on that. You know, one of the things that I love about talking about plants in general and how they fit our nutrition, including the fat, including controversial seed oils, is that I love when, and this I exclaimed at a presentation, but I have to say it now, I did not, I, it was came out of my mouth and now I use it as something to underscore how I feel inherently. I love when modern science shows what mother nature knows. Mm. Very often there are the seeds of like good health in our histories and traditions and cultures, Mm -hmm. things we used to do Mm -hmm. in the traditional table for good health or showed up for health. And then over centuries sometimes or millennia, (laughs) as the case may be, scientists start discovering why, how, Mm. you know, what is the nuance? What are the specifics? What's the smoke point? All those details. I love when that can happen. So if you want to talk flavor, culture, food, and of course, nutrition, Mm -hmm. I loved connecting with others. Awesome. Thank you. And I will, in addition to the links we've already talked about, you did a food and culinary professionals webinar. So I'll have the link to that as well on this topic. And there's also an article on linoleic acid. Uh, I think it's available through a link. If not, I should be able to put the PDF linked in there. And yeah, just have everything that we've touched on at soundbitesrd.com and the related episodes as well. Are are you working on anything else right now that you wanted to share with us before we say goodbye? Oh, thanks. I am working. I'm finishing a book that's been a labor of passion for a long time and getting near the finish line on that. uh, It's almost ready. I'm working here in Southern California with a number of interesting topics, most notably recently a lot about sustainability and nutrition. That's a really exciting area, Mm -hmm. I think, to tap on. You know, things like regenerative agriculture and upcycling nutrition. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's a strong sustainability story is something I'm very passionate about. And I may be actually working on a little podcast of my own. Yay! So I might follow in your lauded footsteps in that direction. Wonderful. What's the book about? The book is about our, and by our, I mean my husband who works with me as a partner uh, for many years here in San Diego in our health clinic. Uh, about our central mantra and tenet, which is eat well, move daily, be healthy. Those three key areas and their simple practices, 52 of them, Mm. uh, simple practices that are science-based that you can do in a self-care approach to help uh, promote good health. It sounds like week by week if it's 52. You got it. (laughs) There you go. Well, awesome. That sounds so exciting. Congratulations. Thank you. And thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing this information. I look forward to applying it in my own kitchen and I hope the listeners will as well. Thank you so much for having me on, Melissa, today with you. Thank you. And for everybody listening, as always, enjoy your food with health in mind. Till next time. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com. This podcast does not provide medical advice. It is for informational purposes only. Please see a registered dietitian for individualized advice. Music by Dave Burke, produced by JAG and Detroit Podcasts. Copyright Soundbites Inc., all rights reserved.